Oh no, that's it. <laughs> Hello, uh, welcome to Just Chops In with my cousin David and our guest today is Leslie Ann Jones, who is an award-winning rock journalist. Um, she was born in Kent in England, but she's got such a lovely Welsh name. I was wondering what her Welsh heritage was. So I did actually look it up earlier and I found that your uncle is an ex-Welsh football player called Cliff Jones. Not only that, but uh, there were the Jones boys to take into account, which was five brothers and three of their sons who came out of the coal mines of South Wales to all of them play for first division as they were in those days, English clubs. My grandfather played for Everton. My great uncle was the world's most expensive player in his day when he was sold by Wolverhampton Wanderers to Arsenal for the world record transfer fee of uh, 14 and a half thousand pounds. Oh, okay. <laughs> Long time ago. Say, was it, who was it? Who was the first million pound player? Dave? Yeah, def definitely wasn't anyone in our family. Yeah, Trevor Francis. But my father was a player as well. My father was a professional. Um, his career was ended when his Achilles tendon snapped. And back then there was no surgery for that. So that was it. And he became a sports writer covering football and boxing for many years. We lost him nearly two years ago. Yeah, yeah, I saw that. Yeah, he, he yeah. lost his hand in a train uh, crash. Well, his, he lost his arm, actually. It was all arm, was it? To the elbow, yeah. Uh, he fell under a train at London Bridge and um, survived. Um, yeah, horribly traumatic thing, but mercifully, he didn't remember it. And no, we used okay. to go, I used to go with him back to the platform at London Bridge Station and stand on the platform and, and just wait for him to remember something. And he never did. There mm. were no recollections at all. And he I thought survived. you were going to say, sorry, go on. I no, no, I said, it, it, go on. I said, I thought you were going to say you used to wave him off as he fell on the train. <laughs> no, but the marvellous thing that my parents did after my father came out of hospital, my mum had always wanted to go on the Orient Express. And my father wasn't blaming trains, obviously. And he took mm. my mum on that journey all the way across Russia. And they had an incredible time. So um, that was my dad, though. My dad was a very unusual person. He, he never missed a column. He was writing for The Independent by then. And I used to go into Guy's Hospital with a reporter's notebook and pen, and he'd dictate his column. I'd write it down, go home. In those days, we were still filing to copy over the phone. And I would file it on his behalf. It would appear in the paper the next day. And until he was back writing full time in the office, his readers never knew the reason why he he was doing this remotely. And and then he wrote about what happened. Yeah, yeah right. terribly yeah. brave. And he carried on working as a journalist until he was seventy four. Okay. And uh, yeah, he a, a great role model to have. I was going to say he must have been a great inspiration to you. Yeah. Totally. Yeah, him. There was. People do say, you know, who inspired you to write? Two people, my, my father, obviously, and David Bowie, who I met when I was a child. He was a local hero to us when we were little school kids in Bromley. He lived in Beckenham down the road. And uh, he had the hit with Space Oddity after not being able to give it away for 10 years. And suddenly he broke through and he was local. He was ours. You know, we used to go and listen to him playing his acoustic guitar in the library gardens. Uh, he wrote about the library gardens. He wrote about the market square. And that was where we would get the 227 bus down to Beckenham and walk up South End Road to his house to get signed photos, which his wife, uh -huh. Angie, would dish out. And I said to my friend, Natasha, one day she's going to be out and he's going to answer the door and he's going to invite us in for tea. And that's what happened. No. Okay. And I remember sitting in his very Christmas colored room, which was all sort of bottle green and red and a silver ceiling. And it was so exotic, so different from home. And I was thinking, I have to grow up to work and live with people like this. But how am I going to do that? I wasn't musical. I wasn't artistic. And then the pennies dropped. I could do what my dad did, which was write about it. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so yeah, I knew at a very early age what I was going to do. Thanks. Thanks to yeah. David Bowie and my dad. Yeah. yeah. Well, he could have been a footballer, but <laughs> he I probably would have been so successful. <laughs> I didn't have the legs for it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so you've worked for Chrysalis Records, I read. I did, yes. Mm. Um, out of college, I worked at Capital Radio. Okay. And uh, I was assigned to Roger Scott, the DJ's DJ. 
And he had a friend at Chrysler's who was John Pash, uh, famously designed the Rolling Stones lapping tongue logo. Oh, right, yeah, yeah, yeah. Which he, I think he got paid about 50 quid when he was an art student. And uh, John was um, art director at Chrysler's and he was looking for an assistant. And it was Roger, he said, you should go along and see John and maybe try and get yourself into Chrysler's. He knew I wanted to work in the music business. Mm -hmm. And I got that, that job and um, yeah, that was amazing because that was my first real face-to-face -face daily contact with artists, with stars. So I was working with people like Blondie and the special AKA and Huey Lewis and Spandau Ballet and, and those caliber of artists. And very quickly you get through that pain barrier of us and them. And yeah, it's yeah. just all us. So they weren't stars to me, they were people. And uh, complicated, very talented, very eccentric people. But it was very good training for me for later on when I went to Fleet Street. And my job was running around after artists, stars, and going on the road with them and reviewing their shows, that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, but I wasn't afraid of them by then because I'd had a lot of exposure to them. Yeah, yeah. Well, I looked at your website earlier, and yeah, you have got quite an extensive list of the people that you've interviewed. I mean, from musicians to film stars to, to well, it's just a, a massive who's who, really. So. I'd like to put a disclaimer on the show that we are not journalists in any shape or form, <laughs> David and myself. <laughs> we're just it's a couple right. of idiots from Wales. Just I think a lot, a lot of people. a lot of we journalists would say we're not journalists, really. We're we're just kind of what are we stalkers? I suppose well, David's <laughs> a stalker. He's got. Can I get called that quite often? Yeah. <laughs> I always I always thought that the job of journalism was was it was less about writing. It was more about finding stuff out. Because when you've had your copy hacked to bits by subs day after day and night after night, you very quickly lose any idea of, of uh, grandeur. You, you, there is no room for you to be above yourself. Mm. Because really all that mattered is you got, you got a headline, you got a story, and uh, then they chop all your fine writing to bits. So it was good training. I think that all the skills that are required to to write these books these biographies they were all acquired on fleet street and yeah. it's just an extended version of what i used to do for 20 odd years um, on newspapers writing books you know instead of you're writing a 1500 word piece you're writing 150,000 words mm -hmm. so it's, it's a it's a longer version of what i always did i had the best training in the world i always knew that if you could survive fleet street you could survive anything and that's it turned out to be true. I'm reaching for a bit of wood to touch because you never know. But, um, <laughs> yeah. yeah, so far, so good. Yeah. Okay, and then you had a bit of a stint on TV then. Yeah, on that's Channel sort of, ESA. Was that your that first it. TV yeah. program? Yeah, that's sort of Warholian 15 minutes of fame because back then there wasn't much telly, was there? There were four channels, and Channel 4 was the newest of them. Yeah, yeah. So if you were on TV, you were you were kind of something in those days whereas nowadays everybody's on television it's all reality tv yeah, anyway yeah, yeah. And, and it doesn't matter anymore and, and ratings are not so high now for for most shows unless it's a football final um but yeah i i mean telly i i was better sitting at a typewriter than i was in front of a camera i do quite a lot of television now because i contribute to lots of documentaries i did nine during the first lockdown Okay. And this, it was an interesting process because they were sending around a box of tricks. So you couldn't go to a studio, they couldn't send a crew, so they'd send the stuff. Fortunately, all my kids came home for the lockdown. So I had a house full of 20 somethings who knew how all this stuff worked and could <laughs> plug it all together. And then the producer was controlling it from, from remotely from wherever yeah, he yeah. was. And uh, it was pretty easy for me. I don't think I could have done it by myself. So I really owe my kids for their expertise during that time. Brilliant. Yeah, that's good. And then you went on, like you said, you've been on tour with a lot of bands. Mm. Was that only writing reviews and things for the, for the shows and the albums? Sometimes it was interviews. Yeah. Uh, back then, it's something that doesn't happen now. You could, as a journalist, have one-to-one -one access to an artist like Paul McCartney. You could have an exclusive interview and you could become friends with them. And we did. Mm. I, um, I often talk about this with Bob Elms. Robert Elms is on BBC Radio London because 
he was around the same era as me and we were moving in the same circles and he ended up going out with Sade and living with her you know and, okay, yeah. and he said yeah, we did move in those circles and we did become friends with artists it wasn't that unusual back then nowadays you don't get a one-to-one -one interview you get a junket so 12 of you sitting around a table everybody's microphones in the middle of the table everybody hears everybody's questions and everybody gets all the answers so there's nothing exclusive about that mm. but in those days it was different and there was a pocket of time when what we did and the access we got was really it, it's what mattered and I've had so many younger journalists come to me over the years and say well, we got into this because of people like you, because we saw what an amazing life you had. There was no internet. Yeah, uh, there were no mobile phones. We, <clears throat> if you wanted to get, I don't know, Arnold Schwarzenegger or something, you had to get on a plane and go to the West Coast and go and knock on his door. You know, there, there was no other way of doing stuff. But I think the advent of the internet took away all of that um, adventurous side of journalism, if you like. So much of what we did was on the fly. We, we, we winged it, if that's the verb. We, yeah, we were yeah. winging it all the time. And you could get fired from a newspaper for not having your passport in your pocket because you had to be ready and willing and able to go to the airport at a minute's notice. And I, I very often did that. My friends used to despair of me because there would be a dinner party or somebody's birthday or something. And yet again, she's not coming because she's off on some job. Uh, but that was the that was what we committed to. That was the lifestyle. Yeah. And uh, yeah, there were good sides of it. There were bad. There were mad sides to it. I miss it, though. But I was a young woman then. And I with a family, I couldn't do that job now. Yeah. 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 Before we touch on your biographies, then, do, are you still friends with any of the artists that you've toured with? Yeah, I'm, you know, yes, actually, I, I will say that I am. Some of them have sadly passed on yeah, now. Yeah. I was very close to John Empwistle, who was the bass player in The Who, yeah. and his girlfriend, Maxine, who's uh, back in America now. And he had a wonderful house called Quarwood down in Still on the World. And we had some mad weekends down there. Oh, my, we really did. The parties went on for three days. And, uh, yeah, I saw some things. Um, I was quite wide eyes eyed in those days. Another great friend of mine was Jim Diamond, who okay, was a yeah. uh, Scottish singer songwriter. Yeah, yeah, I know. Yeah. Um, I should have been lucky. What did he say? I should, I should have known better. I should have known better. Yeah, that was it. I should have known Which was, was his first book. solo number one. And uh, he went on television when he had this first number one ever. And he said, Thank you very much to everybody for buying my single. I really appreciate it. But next week, I want you to go out and buy the Band-Aid single because let's get that to number one instead. Oh, yes. Because do they know it's Christmas had just um, been released? And it was all about raising money for um, what became Live Aid eventually for the starving in uh, Ethiopia. And it was the most selfless thing I'd ever witnessed at that point. But that was Jim. Yeah, he, yeah, I've read some he, stuff uh, about him, actually. Lovely and, uh, man. Yeah, yeah. He left us about five years ago. He yeah, came to no, my... Yeah came to my son's 18th birthday party. And then I went to Chicago to do a lecture and we had lunch just before I went. And he sent me a text, I was at the airport and uh, he said, be lucky and see you when you get back. And that was the last we communicated. Mm -hmm. I was so sad about that. Yeah. So, so sad. Yeah, um, I read some things about yeah. Jim Diamond, actually. He, was, he seemed like a very selfless person. So. Very selfless. I'm still in touch with his wife, Chrissy, and uh, he used to be in a duo on the West Coast years and years ago called uh, Slick Diamond, um, in partnership with Al Slick, who was David Bowie's guitarist, who worked with John Lennon and Yoko on the Double Fantasy album and so on. And uh, he's been over a few times to do some shows and some talks, and I've introduced him on stage a few times and we've become good friends as a result of the connection with Jim okay. and uh, Elle did a he did the Half Moon Putney it's got to be a couple of years ago now because Covid's kind of robbed yeah, us yeah, of um, yeah. our sense of timing hasn't yeah. it really but uh, in the audience so I knew they were there only when they pitched up to say hello Jim Diamond's wife Chrissy and their son Lawrence okay. and I was able to introduce Lawrence to Elle 
because he hadn't known her when he and his father were working together. So that was a really special night. Yeah. It's moments like that that keep it all going, really. Yeah, yeah, yeah that's brilliant, yeah. So you've written a few biographies then, I mm. see. I see on your website. And was your biography on Freddie Mercury then, was that the inspiration for the movie or are they in any way connected? No, Freddie was the inspiration for the movie. And it's, it's very interesting that it's perceived as a film about Queen because really, as much as I love Brian May and Roger Taylor, and John Deacon, who obviously fell off the side some years ago, hasn't been involved in any of this. It, the story was always Freddie. Mm -hmm. Freddie had had the most extraordinary life. Um, born in Africa, the revolution in Zanzibar, they run for their lives, they come to England. He's exposed to a lot of music during the 60s he goes to art school because everybody did if you were Pete Townsend or or Ronnie Wood or or Freddie Mercury or Freddie Bulsara as he still was at that point uh, and then gets involved in the swinging 60s and is in and out of bands and then eventually comes together with these guys from Smile yeah. which was their embryonic band and, and suddenly Queen mm. and it is an amazing story but it's Freddie driven because all the exotic side of it, all the very dramatic, extreme side of it was very much Freddie's life. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, but, but what I mean a, was... Yeah. <coughs> were they... Were, because I read that the movie was supposed to come out around 2012, but it was delayed. So originally there was talk and there was... Uh, well, there were lots of stories at the time, a lot of headlines, that Sasha Baron Cohen was going to yeah, play Freddie that. Mercury. Yeah. With hindsight... That would have been a mistake because what we would have had would have been Sasha Baron Cohen um, at pretending to be Freddie. So you, it would have been more a movie about Sasha being Freddie than it would have been bypass the actor and actually believe in whoever the performer was as Freddie Mercury. So I, I think that, you know, obviously that wouldn't have worked. And then there were various ups and downs over the years. Directors were hired and fired and uh, Peter Morgan wrote a script, it was rejected, then another script was commissioned, and then that didn't, I, eventually somebody else wrote the script, um, but Peter was credited for his early scripts, you'll find his name writ large on the front of that film, and rightly so, and I did meet with Peter, and I did give him a fair amount of background from my own point of view, my own exposure to Freddie and to the band, uh, but by no means was my book, uh, or was the film the film of my book or anything like that. Ah, it, was, right, okay. it was inspired by Freddie. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah. But oh, what yeah. happened when the when the when the film came out, my publisher decided to re-release the book. Okay. And they changed the title so that it became Bohemian Rhapsody, the definitive biography of Freddie Mercury. And uh, so the, the book had a whole new lease of life because of the film. Ah, right. So you saw the copies. <laughs> yeah. There were things <laughs> there were things wrong with the film. I, think I know there was, yeah. Lots of lists kicking around and somebody notched up something like 78 um, glaring errors, things that didn't happen. And I know that Brian and Roger did a fair amount of work to try and explain that it was, uh, you can't fit 45 years of somebody's life into a 90 minute or a two hour film. It doesn't work like that. You've got to condense the story and you've got to tell a story as well. Mm -hmm. So it's not a set of encyclopedias when you write a book. It, it has to be a tale that, that will lure the reader along and it has to be a page turner. So yes, I agree, you've got to leave stuff out, but I don't believe that you have to rewrite history. And yeah, yeah. some of the film did do that. Yeah, with, there was a few with, timing errors in it and stuff. Yeah, there were. But also things like you had a scene where Freddie, during the rehearsals for Live Aid, in, at the end of June 1985, that he announced to the other members of the band that he had it, meaning yeah, AIDS. Yeah. Well, that didn't happen. Freddie didn't get his diagnosis for another two years. Yeah, yeah. So, And he wasn't ill at that time. Yeah. They What happened was Queen were been in a bad place they'd got a ban from the musicians union in 84 for playing at sun city down in south africa they they've been involved in various solo projects and they've been together about 15 years by that time and lots of bands don't last half that long yeah uh, you know the beatles as a touring band lasted less than half that time it's it's very interesting to make the comparison but they were sort of thinking 
about going their separate ways. And then came the invitation to do Live Aid. Well, they were miffed by that because they weren't asked to be on the Band Aid single. So Freddie was like, oh, well, you know, they left us off the single. Why do they want us to do the show? Well, Bob Geldof said to their manager, Jim Beach, it's the ideal stage for Freddie Mercury. It's the whole world. Mm. And of course, put to him in that way, he found it very hard to turn down. So they mm. did say yes to it. And what they found that day, because they rehearsed for something like three weeks, they were they knew their audience. That wasn't the, their audience out there. That was everybody's audience. So what could they do to appeal to this audience? They had to play their greatest hits. They had so many to choose from, but they couldn't play complete songs. They had to play a sort of medley of bits of songs. And so they honed this act that was the best of their best of, and they had 18 minutes to deliver it. They had their sound guy go out just before they went on and whack the sound up. So they were louder than everybody else. And they yeah, yeah. made a huge impact. They were by far the best band. And because of that, they got the confidence to go again. And so then the following year, they went out on the magic tour. Mm -hmm. um, and really, they, they thought they were going to get a second lease of life. But of course, by that time, things were starting to turn for Freddie health wise. Mm -hmm. And the world tour that was intended didn't happen. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a shame. Because they did. They, I mean, I remember Live Aid. I mean, I watched it on, on TV and... Uh, yeah, they definitely made a massive impact, and the, it did revitalize their career. And uh, yeah, it's just a shame that, that he did get the diagnosis after AIDS, and uh, yeah, he couldn't go. But on. Uh, yeah, he had. I mean, we forget, don't we? But we shouldn't. Um, the fact that he was still making music for some years after that, and he had his whole Barcelona era yeah. and the work he did with Montserrat Caballé, and. I believe that he wouldn't have continued with Queen much longer anyway, had he not become ill, because he was very conscious of his age. And he said there was something faintly ridiculous about prancing around at the age of 45 and still being a rock queen, darling. And, uh, you know, maybe it was time to, to sort of tone that down a little bit. But he'd found a different genre of music by then. He was aware of Montserrat Caballé. He believed she was the best singer in the world. And the idea of working with her, even the stars have their stars. That was the point. Yeah, yeah. And she was a global superstar to him. So it was magnificent of her to agree to work with him. And she felt the same. She, it rejuvenated her as well. So the work they did together, I think, was tremendous. And I think Freddie going forward, had he not become ill and died, would perhaps have given a series of special concerts in some of the greatest uh, opera houses around the world, the special venues, and they would have been one-off events that would have had huge build-up. And he was appealing to a different audience by then. So it was a crossover thing. He was the first one to do that, to, to take rock and opera and yeah. to blend the two. A lot of people did it after him, but he was the first. And I think that would have been his way forward because he could have carried on doing that until his voice gave out, really. Yeah. And yeah. very few singers are still going into their 60s, even. It's quite unusual. In the rock genre, yeah, we have it. But we know from, say, Elton John, that or Paul McCartney even, God bless his soul, that the voice doesn't stand up. So what we're really hearing when we go to a concert by somebody of their caliber, but of their age, is how they used to sound, not how they sound now. Mm. Hmm. Well, there is one person that's still banging it out, Go 81 on. years old. Yeah. And he's got the same surname as you. Yeah, Tom Jones. Oh, okay. Well, yes, but a completely different genre of singing. Yeah, it's a different genre, but his voice is amazing. It's it's still... It is incredible, isn't it? So, uh, yes, it's unbelievable. But it would be because he's a Welshman, right? That's right. <laughs> that's right. From Pondy Something special in the water down there. Yeah. there really is. We, we can all sing in Wales. Yeah. yeah, except my dad wasn't much of a singer, but yeah. I bet he could play rugby and football. He could do all kinds yeah. else, yeah. <laughs> okay, so then you've written other biographies, I mean, on Kylie Minogue and Mark Bolan, mm. and, uh, and now your latest biography. I think you've written a biography on John Lennon before, have you? I haven't, actually. I wrote a novel called Imagine. Oh, it was a novel, okay. It was a story um, that I dreamt. It was... Uh, what would have happened had a, 
I suppose I was writing about me, but she was a fictitious character, a young journalist who had happened to be outside the Dakota building the night John was assassinated. What would you have done? Would you have gone away and absorb that information to yourself and, and just try to live with it and process it? Or would you have written about it? And it was about that dichotomy decision and the, the knock-on effect on this young journalist's life because of what she did. So it was okay. an imagined story, oh, right. okay. the title, yeah. yeah. Okay, so now, and now you have released a biography then? Yes. Which is called John Lennon, Who Killed John Lennon? Yeah. Is that a subtitle that likes Loves and Deaths of the Greatest it's, Rock Star? Yeah, it's a cryptic, um, cryptic title. It's, it occurred to me two things. So there have obviously been thousands, hundreds of books about the Beatles and about John. The vast majority of them, apart from two small memoirs by John's sister, Julia Baird, and a couple of quite bitter uh, memoirs by Cynthia Lennon, his first wife, mm -hmm. they were all written by male music writers. Okay. And I wanted to tell John's story through the women in his life, because there was a string of significant females who, uh, from, from right from when he was born, who drove his life and who explained who he was. And I, so I wanted to go through the female route and to get into the psychological side of John and to delve into his emotions and to, to work out what kind of a man he became because of what kind of childhood and teenage years and upbringing in general that he'd had. And I discovered fairly early on that there were, there were lots of Johns. There wasn't just one finished packaged John Lennon, but there had been various variations on the theme. And he'd reinvented himself quite a lot through life. And he discarded versions of himself. And he'd moved on to, to another kind of John. So who was the original John Lennon? And when did he die? And mm -hmm. who killed him? Or what killed him? What, so what were the circumstances, really, that led to that John being discarded? and leading to the next incarnation of John and the one after that, and the one after that. Because it was like a Russian doll, you know, the way you take the lid yeah, off and yeah, there's another yeah, one inside yeah. it, and it was all that. So there were, there were so many layers to, to dig down through. Okay. okay. Before I found him. Yeah, so was it pretty much every relationship that he had, that was kind of like a, a start or an end of a John and then a, a beginning of a new John Lennon? You'd like to think that it was as cut and dried as that, mm. but I don't think it was. There was a lot of overlap. So, for example, uh, when he was married to Cynthia, he was involved in an affair with Al McCogan, who was a big pop star in this country in the 1950s. She was the girl with the laugh in her voice. She was the first major female artist to kind of break through into radio and television. And she was about seven years older than John. They met at the London Palladium and they fell for each other. They embarked on an affair. They used to check into hotels around London as Mr. and Mrs. Winston, which was his middle name. And he adored her, he absolutely adored her. Cynthia did know about it and she couldn't believe it because she said at college when they were art students, John used to do a wicked impersonation of Alma Cogan. And, yeah. uh, the, the kind of very sugary saccharine songs that she would sing and he would prance around taking the mick and and so Cynthia just couldn't believe but I suppose it's hiding in plain sight isn't it we yeah, would say yeah. um you would be dismissive of something that you were actually really into yeah yeah and then Alma contracted ovarian cancer and she became very sick and she died at 36. John was devastated and within a fortnight he'd turned around and met Yoko Ono and cleaved to her. She was another mother figure. She was eight years older than John. And he did leave Cynthia for her. We know the circumstances. He conducted the affair, the affair under Cynthia's nose uh, to the point that Cynthia was humiliated. And that was unforgivable really. But I suppose yeah. he was a coward. He didn't know how else to handle it. He had no male role model in his life yeah. because his father had cleared off when he was a tiny child, gone off to sea, never came back until John was 21 and world famous. And his auntie Mimi, who brought him up, 
Yeah. Her husband, Uncle George, he was a lovely man. And he was very affectionate to John, introduced him to literature, newspapers, sketching, crosswords, cartoons, all those kind of things that, that really woke up John's creativity. He died tragically when John was 15. So his, the one person who was feeding him any affection, he was gone as well. John was getting no guidance from any male role model at that stage. So you can almost forgive him for not knowing how to treat women. But he was also spiteful. He was very bitter. He was violent on occasion. He did beat Cindy around. And okay. also at Paul McCartney's 21st birthday party, he um, injured Bob Wooler, who was the DJ at the Cabin Club, so badly that Bob Wooler was carried off on a stretcher to hospital. John beat him up because Bob Wooler teased him about being gay because he'd just been on holiday to Spain with Brian Epstein when his poor wife was at home having just given birth two weeks before. Imagine a husband today trying to get away with that one. Yeah. Oh, let's go yeah. off on a boy's jolly. You know, the wife's fine. She's just given birth. It's, it's fine. I mean, any woman today with self-respect wouldn't be there when he got home. Yeah. That'd be yeah. the end of it, wouldn't it? Yeah, yeah. definitely, yeah. Yes. So, yeah, he, well, he, well, he was definitely a bit of a character, but I mean, reading through the lines, I mean, I was, I suppose I was thinking with the different art incarnations of John, um, do you think when the Beatles eventually split up, that had a lot, a lot of effect on him? I think John couldn't wait to leave the Beatles. I think, really? that, yeah, what happened? The Beatles were broken. Yoko Ono got the blame. Yeah, she was vilified. Yeah. She was the woman who broke up the Beatles. No, she didn't. They were broken. Actually, they grew up. So they were very young boys when they, when they got together in the first place. They'd gone to Hamburg. They'd done their 10,000 hours. They'd broken through. They'd become a world-famous band. But they were kids. They were in their early 20s. They were hmm. so young. It's astonishing. And it was inevitable that they would grow up and they would grow apart. Because the band of boys, that sort of dreamlike state, is a very transient period. And people do mature and they do then look for partners. And the partners will take you in new directions. Also, if you're a musician, you don't want to stagnate. You don't want to carry on. All the public want you to do is carry on making the same music. Yeah, they just yeah, want yeah. more of the same. Yeah. Whereas if you're a musician, you want to carry on pushing the boundaries of your creativity. So to do that, you have to work with other musicians. And John was desperate to get out of the Beatles and work with others. Okay. Um, he had said in about September 69 that he was quitting. There were lots of legal things going on around that time as well, because Paul McCartney had met Linda, his mm. wife-to-be. Um, her father and brother were lawyers, and Paul was inclined to take the Beatles to the Eastmans, her family. Whereas John favoured Alan Klein, who'd managed the Rolling Stones. So there was dissent mm. and it was going to end in tears. It always was. But it didn't necessarily mean a terminal falling out. Okay. And it wasn't the reason John and Yoko went to America either. They didn't go to escape the fury of the Beatles breakup and all the racism that Yoko was being subjected to. They went because Yoko's little girl, Kyoko, who was eight, had been abducted by her okay. birth father and they went to find her. And the tragedy was that they never got her back. But because she was Yoko's child, that wasn't widely reported, was it? It's, no, it's not no, something no. most people are aware of. Yeah. She was also John Lennon's stepdaughter and he doted on her. And it caused an awful lot of problems. He never saw her again. Yoko didn't see her again for 30 years. Okay. It's a nightmare. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, because it really, there seemed like two fractures of the band. I mean, obviously one with Paul meeting Linda. Mm. That, that was credited with a lot of it also. Mm. And with John meeting Yoko. Mm -hmm. But um, yeah, I mean, to know the real story, you know. It's all in the book. Yeah, yeah. Very good. So have you got any more biographies in the pipeline? I do. What I do do? Uh, I have a new book on Freddie coming out on the 2nd of September okay. called Love of My Life. And it's really a gathering of those people aforementioned who didn't make the cut of the film. So people like Barbara Valentin, who was a German actress 
she and Freddie shared an apartment together in Munich and they were very much involved. She was left out of the film, mm. uh, as was Munich, really. Munich didn't really get much of a mention. And a few others, Montserrat Cavalier, she's very much in there. And uh, Freddie's awakening to the tune of Jimi Hendrix, that kind of thing. So I've, I've gone into those important relationships and who was the love of Freddie's life. That's what okay. this book is about. And I'm also working on a new study of the Rolling Stones who, believe it or not, next year, July 2022, is their 60th anniversary as a band. Can really? you imagine? Oh, 60 yeah. years of the Rolling Stones. They're going to live forever, those guys, I think. Well, you kind of wonder. I mean, their collective age is more than 300. Yeah. And uh, they're still out there, still doing it. Um, quite a force of nature, really, aren't they? Yeah, yeah, they definitely sold their souls mm. to the devil, then, boys. <laughs> and maybe they did. Maybe that was the secret. Maybe we uh, went wrong somewhere back along the line. I don't know. I don't look too bad for me. No, you look great <laughs> for 108. I mean, yeah, yeah I'm doing very well. <laughs> well, I've got a picture of Doreen. Well, it's supposed to be Doreen Gray, but it's me. And actually, you've got one upstairs. in the attic. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. I think I've always thought Mick Jagger actually has the reverse picture in the attic. Yeah. So, so there's a very <laughs> yeah. pretty boy up there because the, the craggy one that we have out on stage. I mean, I think he, he has a waist measurement of 27 inches. That's and incredible. He, he's about nine stone, you know. So he's actually, he's shrunk quite a lot. He's, he's a pretty tiny guy. But mm. I think the, the moral of the story is don't put weight on. I think that's what keeps them going, really. Take they didn't drugs. get fat. Oh, no, they stopped they? taking drugs now, haven't they? Yeah. <laughs> I, and I think they've got some very uh, well-paid doctors on the road with them looking after them when they're out there as well. Yeah, yeah, I guess. Yeah. yeah. So, have you got any questions, Dave? No, not really. Not really. It's, um, it's just really good to see how passionate you are about these um, about these bands. Oh, anything. thank you. Uh, I, yeah, it's my life. It, it yeah. has been my passion in my life. And yeah, I, people say, you know, how do you how do you really get to who one of these artists is? And I always say the same thing: listen to the music, because mm. all the secrets, all the dysfunction, all the clues to their life stories, it's all there in those lyrics and in those melodies. I always start with the music when I'm starting a new book. I immerse myself in it and I drive around and I still play CDs in my car because I'm old, you know, so I'm, I have that excuse. Um, I, I'm not too technical, let's say. I, I much prefer, I play vinyl at home mm. um, and I play CDs in the car. And so I gather all the music and, and I just play it over and over again and remind myself of it all. And then I go in sort of that route, really. Yeah. It's, it's where it starts and finishes is the music. For me, anyway. Okay. Okay. Yeah. So you, mm. you've obviously interviewed an awful lot of people. Who, yes. Um, who would you say has been your, you know, your most memorable? Oh gosh. Ah, uh, let's think. I've been so many. I mean, the stories you could tell, really. But um, there haven't been many negative ones. Let's say that. Um, the one who was that sticks in my mind wasn't actually a musician at all. He was an actor. Richard Gere, and I went to Philadelphia to interview him. And you know how people say you have that experience of love at first sight with someone? We had the opposite. <laughs> we absolutely could not stand each other on first meeting. And I very quickly knew which way this was gonna go. Mm -hmm. And every question I put to him, he picked on, he found some reason to humiliate me. And so I was piling on a bit thick and in the end he walked out and I went back and I wrote this piece. I was at the Daily Mail at the time and the opening paragraph of the, the interview was the most genuine thing about Richard Gere is his Rolex watch. <laughs> and I got called into the editor. He sat me down and he said, LA, as they will call me, I, I can't run this piece, why not? He said, well, what you have to understand is that the editor in chief of the newspaper, David English, Sir David English, uh, wears a fake Rolex. So I said, <laughs> You're joking. I mean, he was rich, you know, he's what is one of the best paid, paid men on Fleet Street. I said, No, don't be daft. He said, I, I promise you. I was with him in a market in Hong Kong when he paid $30 for it. No way. He said, We won't get away with this piece. So it was kind of a waste of time, the whole thing. But uh, yeah, an experience, really, yeah. because. Yes, they all have bad days. And mm. 
maybe journalists have bad days as well. But if, mm. if the journalist, if the hack and the artist is having a bad day on the same day, then you've got no chance, really. Yeah. But it can happen to the best of us. So. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, I, well, I, I mean, I was quite nervous about this. I can't, I don't, <laughs> like, I don't like calling interviews, but uh, it's not really interviews, just... Well, it's an exchange, isn't it? It's yeah, an exchange, yeah. 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 I was thinking, God, this woman's interviewed so many people, so many different people. What's she going to make of us? But, uh, yeah, it's been like, really nice chatting with you, so... Well, and for me as well, and uh, obviously I'm uh, well disposed towards you because you're Welshman, so... <laughs> so that's been a treat for me. Thank you. Brilliant. Okay. Thank you very much. So, well, thank you for coming on, uh, telling us about your books uh, and a bit about your life as well. It's been very interesting. Thank yeah. you very much. And I hope you come back to promote your new book. Oh, I'd love to. I'll be back very soon. Thank you. Oh, right, brilliant. That's great. Oh, that's okay. Great. Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Okay, See you later. Thank you. Okay, bye. Bye. <laughs> you were very good then, Terry. Thank you very much. You were very good. Yeah, it was very um it was it was a nice watch for me because obviously you were asking all the questions and um it's just the passion, obviously the passion that Leslie has, you know, with regards to these individuals and you know, liking to understand, you know, wanting to understand their life a lot more as well. It's um it's great. It was yeah. really good, you know, and when she moved, you know, when she was talking about Freddie, you could see the passion, and then she moved on to on to John Lennon, and the passion was there again. And then yeah, yeah. The Rolling Stones, you can just see, you know, she's got lots and lots of passion about about the music, which is brilliant. Yes, so yeah, I enjoyed that actually. Yeah, good. It Once good. I got into it, I was uh, I was okay. I was <laughs> I was fucking shitting myself to be honest. You were. <laughs> I always start. It's it's great because it's normally me. <laughs> so I looked at her list, and I was thinking. Uh, it, I just thought, oh, this is just going to be so wrong. But yeah, luckily she was a really nice person, and uh, yeah, yeah, she wasn't one of these uh, Richard Gear types. No, and she <laughs> and she had a lovely voice. She's, she she's did. Got, she's got the sort of voice that you can just keep listening to. Perfect. Yeah, forever. Like, yeah, like a like a like obviously with a male it would have been Richard Burton. Yeah, that sort of voice. Yeah, yeah. you could just listen to Anthony Hopkins has got it. And uh, Leslie's got that voice. You can just sit there and just listen to it for ages and ages. So I don't know if she does. I should have asked her that actually. Whether um, she does the voiceovers, audio, yeah, like the audio books as well. Mm -hmm. Well, she did do a Pampers advert, I think, which oh, ran for eighteen months. <laughs> okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I mean, that might have been a claim to fame, but but uh, yeah, lovely, very good. I enjoyed that. Yeah, it was good. I enjoyed it too. Yeah. I mean, like I said, I was a bit nervous before we started. And then obviously, uh, uh, but as it progressed, it, it went really well. So, yeah, that was good. Very good, wasn't it? All right. Well, thanks, mate. Yeah, no problem. I'll let you get off. And because uh, it's a bit late now. But um, yeah, we'll share our socials, which is justchopsin.com, YouTube, Twitter, Instagram, Facebook, just chopsin or just chops and podcast and uh, we will share Leslie's stuff. I don't know what social she's got actually. I don't think there's a lot. I know she's on Twitter, I believe, but her Facebook is very private. And uh, so we'll just have to share her links to her website and stuff. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sounds like a plan. All right. Then, mate. Well, I'll let you get off and uh, we'll say goodbye for yeah. this quite a remarkable episode of just chops and podcast without any swearing from me well not until after the guests got anyway i don't know you might have you might have been able to you might have held it together maybe i didn't swear when she was on no 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 but you did say you shit yourself so yeah <laughs> did i say that once when i was talking to her no oh it's good say. yeah afterwards <laughs> all right, anyway. all right okay. i'm gonna hit that i'm gonna hit the stop button yeah take i'll care. catch you later Stra -tra.